change begins from within. As easy as it is to look outside of ourselves and want the world to change, the truth is, it never will if we remain the same. This podcast was created for change makers like you who want more love and connection in your community. Today, you are going to hear stories that will inspire you and also challenge you to be the change. We are going to go deep, my friend. So take a deep breath and settle in. My name is Emilia Tamburini. Welcome to the Circle of Change. Hello, friend. Thanks for being here today for this special episode of Circle of Change. You know that I created this podcast to help us find ways to be the change in our day-to-day lives. Part of why I did this is that sometimes we think that being the change is about being in these big roles, like the leader of an organization or a country, or being on stages and having programs that serve thousands of people. But that really puts conditions on who can be a change maker. And I believe that we are all change makers. And the only way we will bring about a more loving and peaceful and sustainable world is if we all own that. Donna's powerful story is a reminder that change starts from within. And it happens every day in every interaction we have with others. This story shows us that trauma can be a healing force for others if we are courageous enough to share our story and heal together. The more I do these shows, the more I think that that actually is the most powerful form of being the change. It's not about the big acts. It's about the vulnerability we show day to day in service to others. Today, we are joined by Donna Wales. Donna is a wife, a mom, a technology teacher, and a domestic abuse survivor and subject expert. Her book, I'll Pray For You, is a must-read on marital abuse as told by the victim, says an Amazon review. She is sharing her story of surviving domestic violence to be a beacon of hope. Donna is such a special soul, and I'm grateful for her courage to come share this story with us. I want to warn you that we do talk about domestic violence, and you may find some of her stories disturbing. If this will be upsetting or traumatizing for you, then you might not want to take in this episode or skip to around the halfway mark. Her website has many thoughtful resources on domestic violence. So if you or someone you know is in a situation that needs tending to, I recommend heading there. There are so many life lessons in this episode. First of all, Donna is able to paint us a picture of the twisted sense of normal that is domestic violence. She speaks very candidly to the isolation that can happen when you do take a stand for yourself. She really recognizes how our trauma can help us serve others more deeply, and you'll see how she's doing that. She talks about what is helpful for people when you can't relate to their experience. She also speaks to what is most important in life, but told through the eyes of children. And then she leaves us with the most profound response yet to what I think it means to be the change. When I listen to stories like Donna's, it reminds me to listen more and judge less. The truth is, we never know what it is like to walk in somebody else's shoes. And Donna gives us an opportunity to walk in hers for a while from being in a violent relationship to making a difference every day in the lives of her students. This is really a conversation about resilience and kindness, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Welcome, Donna, to the Circle of Change. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am looking forward to this conversation. I I really think it's an important conversation that we're about to have. You and I are fairly new to each other. We connected at an event that gathered people together who had a message to share. We met up afterwards, and it was then that I got to hear your story. 
And I was so deeply touched by what I heard and your journey that I really wanted to bring it to this sacred space here today. For the listener who's joining us today, this is a really sacred journey that we're about to hear and be on and one that I want you to really hold with reverence as we uncover what is here to be uncovered and and shared with you today. But I think it's going to be a very powerful conversation. I can feel that already. So as we begin, I'm going to read a poem. This is our opportunity to ground into this space. If you want to put your feet on the ground, this goes for you too, Donna. And Even close your eyes and take a deep breath and exhale any distractions that keep you from hearing that nugget that you are here to hear today. The poem that I'm going to read is by Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh is a Buddhist who passed away recently. He's on another journey now. So it's an honor for me to share his words with you as we start our journey here today. The poem is called Looking for Each Other. I have been looking for you, world-honored one, since I was a little child. With my first breath, I heard your call and began to look for you, blessed one. I've walked so many perilous paths confronted so many dangers, endured despair, fear, hopes, and memories. I've trekked to the farthest regions, immense and wild, sailed the vast oceans, traversed the highest summits, lost amongst the clouds. I've lain dead, utterly alone, on the sands of ancient deserts. I've held in my heart so many tears of stone, Blessed one, I've dreamed of drinking dewdrops that sparkle with the light of far-off galaxies. I've left footprints on celestial mountains and screamed from the depths of Avicii hell, exhausted, crazed with despair because I was so hungry, so thirsty. For millions of lifetimes, I've longed to see you, but didn't know where to look. Yet I've always felt your presence with a mysterious certainty. I know that for thousands of lifetimes, you and I have been one, and the distance between us is only a flash of thought. Yet just yesterday, while walking alone, I saw the old path strewn with autumn leaves and the brilliant moon hanging over the gate suddenly appeared like the image of an old friend. And the stars confirmed that you were there. All night, the rain of compassion continued to fall while lightning flashed through my window. And a great storm arose, as if earth and sky were in battle. Finally, in me, the rain stopped. The clouds parted, the moon returned, shining peacefully, calmly, earth and sky. Looking into the mirror of the moon, suddenly I saw myself. And I saw you smiling, blessed one. How strange. The moon of freedom has returned to me, everything I thought I had lost. From that moment on, and in each moment that followed, I saw that nothing had gone. There is nothing that should be restored. Every flower, every stone, and every leaf recognize me. Wherever I turn, I see you smiling, the smile of no birth and no death, the smile I received while looking at the mirror of the moon. I see you sitting there, solid as Mount Maru, calm as my own breath, sitting as though no raging firestorm ever occurred, sitting in complete peace and freedom. At last, I have found you, blessed one, and I have found myself. There I sit. The deep blue sky, the snow-capped mountains painted against the horizon, and the shining red sun sing with joy, You, blessed one, are my first love, the love that is always present, always pure, and newly fresh. And I shall never need a love that will be called last. You are the source of well-being flowing through numberless troubled lives, the water from your spiritual stream always pure, as it was in the beginning. You are the source of peace, solidity, and inner freedom. You are the Buddha the Tegagata, with 
my one pointed mind. I vow to nourish your solidity and freedom in myself so I can offer solidity and freedom to countless others now and forever. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again, Donna. Thank you for having me. And that poem was lovely. Mm. Did anything come up for you? There were. There were a couple of pieces where the kind of putting things back together and the idea of nothing is missing and everything works together. I have to pick this up and, and read that again. That was fun. It's definitely one to absorb, I think, over and over. Yeah. <laughs> it reminded me of what potentially your journey has been like. That's, I think, why I was called to share it today. And we'll see if it, it continues to weave its way through our conversation. That's exactly what I was getting, is the journey. So to begin... I always start with this question of who are you? It's a question that I personally love. It's been one that I've explored quite a bit, continue to explore, I think, every day. And, and it's one I love to offer to anyone who comes here to be with us in circle. So who are you, Donna Wales? There are so many ways to answer that question. But I guess the best way to answer that question is about a little over 10 years ago, I was living in, well, not really hiding, but I was trying to keep a low profile. My ex-husband was abusive and I, I had just left him and I was standing in the kitchen of a little mobile home that I was renting for my daughter who was about two and I. And I remember standing in the kitchen thinking, what am I going to have for dinner? And, you know, you, you work all day and then you get home and you wonder what's for dinner. But then this thought came over me of, you know, I could have anything I wanted for dinner. No one was going to tell me I couldn't make squash casserole or I couldn't make onions or garlic or anything that was smelly, as my ex-husband would say. And, and that thought led me to, what's my favorite color? I could choose any color I wanted. I could reinvent myself. And it was just this whole conversation in my head going, wow, this is all new to me because I had been married and I had been, a well, I was at that point a domestic violence survivor. And I was getting a chance to recreate myself and who am I? And so I have, you know, from there growing, and so I'm a mom, I'm, a, I'm remarried, so I'm a wife, I'm a school teacher, I teach technology education, and I'm a domestic violence, you could say subject expert, but I'm a domestic violence survivor. And so all of those things make up who I am, but I'm more than just one of those. That is powerful. The simplicity but profoundness of the questions you began to ask yourself in that mobile home really struck me to be like, yeah, that's those were simple freedoms, and yet those felt not available to you. And to have them back and then just to have that moment of realization and, and then having what seems like a world open up to you is really profound. Yes, it was a very, you know, it was a moment that I don't think I would forget, you know, just kind of standing there in the kitchen going, oh, no, no, I could, you know, I don't have to wear whatever it is to impress anyone. This is, this is my body and I get to, you know, so it really was a very profound thought that started with, what am I making for dinner? Mm, yeah. Oh, amazing. So I would love to hear more about your journey and whatever it is you're willing to share, because we met in a place where all of us were there to share our story, to share our voice. And this has really become your mission. And so what was your journey to get to this place 
that you are in right now? I met my abusive now ex-husband at a church picnic in Hawaii. He was stationed there and I was there as a school teacher. At first, you know, I thought it was just cute that he wanted to know where I was all the time. And, oh, look, he cares so much. And I went to lunch with an old friend from college and you would have thought that I was like cheating on him or something, but we weren't engaged. We weren't even dating seriously. And I had lunch with someone from college from years ago and he must have called my phone 10 times and texted and all these things. And I'm thinking, why are you so upset? And he's crying and all these things. And I'm thinking, why are you so upset? But I got back to the house where I was supposed to meet him later. My friend who we were double, we were double dating, but my friend's mom said, you know, you need to apologize to him. You really hurt his feelings. And I was like, I went to lunch. I I hurt his feelings. And she's like, well, you know, that's what a good Christian girl, you know, that's what a good Christian woman would do because we have to be kind and forgiving. So I kind of made a half apology and look, I'm really sorry that you were upset, but I went to lunch and that was a big red flag that I missed. And then because he was in the Navy and the church that we were attending was really big into not dating, but more like courting. So I married him sooner than I should have, actually, you know, looking back. So after about six or eight months, we got married. And then the next red flag was we went to visit his family. And, you know, it just as as a nice gesture, I was thirsty. I was going to go get some water or whatever from the kitchen. And we were all watching a movie. And he kicked my feet out from under me when I got up to ask if anybody wanted water and I landed on the on the floor and it really hurt I landed on my backside on the floor and it really hurt and he just laughed at me and so and I was trying to hold back tears and he said oh you should have seen your face it was so funny and I said it's not funny you hurt me oh but it was really funny it was a joke it really was not a joke. It was part of that power and control kind of things. And, you know, fast forward, we were married 12 years. He was in the Navy. So what I usually tell people is that I wasn't drunk when I married him. I wasn't high. These things don't, like, as an abuse victim, you become a twisted sense of, it becomes a twisted sense of normal. And you don't know what anything else. He's was getting more controlling, more angry. And the day that I left him was, he was really upset. He had separated all of our things into what he was allowing me to keep and what he was keeping. And I had come back from mentoring at a Navy spouse um, training. And I was teaching other Navy spouses how to you know, read their pay stubs and, and tell military time and that kind of thing, just it's a really different culture. And so I came home and he had sorted all my things and I noticed there were a lot of things missing. And so I was asking him, you know, where's my favorite, this, that, or, you know, even my makeup and my jewelry, you know, you went through my desk. So he was pacing and more and more agitated. And so I was going to call my friend who I had made a safety plan just in case. And I never thought I would have to use it, but I called her. And as I, as she picked up the phone, my ex-husband grabbed me by the back of the neck and my arm and smashed me into the storm door of our apartment. I'm not leaving. You are. And a couple of times, and I didn't know how many times he was going to do that. So somehow my hands got through the netting of the storm door in the bottom And I was able to pull my hand back out and find the latch. And I really don't know how I got down from the top. I remember touching the top of the door frame. And then I remember touching the bottom stair. And I I really think that the angels must have carried me the rest of the way because I did not touch any of those stairs. From there, there was Navy detectives and there were other people who said, you know, he tried to kill you and they believed him 
fit when he told them that he was trying to kill me. And so going from that to fast forward to today, where I teach in a middle school classroom, I teach kids who don't speak English. A lot of them are newly immigrated to the U.S., kids with special needs. I really enjoy enjoy teaching them technology and the opportunities because of my background to be able to share that it's a trauma bond but but it's kind of a trauma bond with them and to say hey it's okay because I went through this and there's a way on the other side too you know so my journey to here was not not uneventful how's that but you know at the end I'm so much better off and you know I really feel like I have been blessed with everything that everything that I lost when literally my face hit the storm door everything that I lost has been restored and it's been amazing thank you for sharing your story not only here, I know you're sharing it elsewhere, and I just know how powerful this has been for so many people who get to share in your experience and also see where you are today. Because I can imagine in those places, there are times where there's not a lot of hope or light. And your story really is a story of light. and new possibilities. Absolutely. Right down to the minister of the church that I was attending called me while I was staying and hiding with with a friend who had hidden my car under a tarp in their barn. And he called me to tell me that if I didn't go back to my abuser, that they were going to excommunicate me out of the church. And I was just shattered all of the things that I had done for you know keeping in the church and those were my friends and all of the things that it was just unimaginable and I lost you know in in the divorce I lost my house because the Navy wouldn't take his keys away so it wasn't safe for me to stay there I lost my job I lost my friends I lost you know my my sense of self and my safety as I'm sitting in the hospital and the detectives are taking pictures of all the bruises, you know, it just was almost as if I was watching this happen to someone else. And so now to be able to share that and say, there is hope to get through this. There is a change you can, you know, is it awful? Absolutely. Absolutely. I wouldn't wish it on anyone but life is so much better on the other side. I wouldn't say it's worth it, but it, but it is worth it. All of the trials, if you can just hold on to that little tiny sliver of, of hope and kindness in the world, then that's. I want to stay in the, in the story a little bit in that your book, it's titled, I'll Pray For You. And when I read that title, I got the shivers and I just thought, there's so much under that, those words. And I'm curious about that title for you, what it means. And you've touched on your Christian community and what that was like for you. And I would love to hear more about what is underneath that title. I'll pray for you. The title is sarcastic. It's tongue in cheek. So I told you that I was staying in hiding at my friend's house and it was dangerous for her to keep me and my daughter, who was a year and a half old, there to keep us there. So I went to the home of a different friend, and this was the head elder of my church. He was said, so there's the pastor, and then the, there's like the elders, and he was the head elder. He and his wife had hosted my baby shower. They had taken us to lunch and shopping for the baby and all this kind of stuff. And so I went there thinking that they would help us. But when I got there, he answered the door and he kept his arm across the door and didn't let us in. I said, I need help. And he said, but he's dangerous. And I said, well, yeah, I know I have, I have bruises. And he said, well, 
we're not going to be able to help you anymore, but I'll pray for you. Good luck. And he just dismissed me. Again, that, that whole ache and that emptiness of, I thought you were my friends. I thought, you know, you, you're the church people. Shouldn't you be helping me? And I walked back and got in my car and I was just, again, just crushed with, you know, these people were some of our, some of my best friends and they were not willing to get involved anymore. And so I'll pray for you is that generic thoughts and prayers, but we're not going to get involved. Good luck. Looking back, at that, where you are today, how do you see that situation? Do you look at them or those words in a different light? You know, when someone says, pray for me or, you know, thoughts and we're sending our thoughts and prayers, it makes me want to do more. Thoughts and prayers are, those are nice, but sometimes we need to actually put feet to those prayers and do something for someone, even if it's like there was a lady who took me to Target and bought me like underwear and socks and a jacket to go to wear into court because I couldn't go back to my house to get anything. And all I owned was the contents of what was in my daughter's diaper bag at the time of the incident. You know, so sometimes it looks like taking somebody to Target and buying them underwear You know, and other times it looks like there was one of the ladies that I stayed with, the lady who hit us and put my car in her barn with a tarp over it. I was sitting there one afternoon and my daughter was, you know, a year and a half old, so she was napping. And she brought me a cup of tea and she sat down with me and said, you know, I'd like to, if you don't mind sharing, I'd like to hear a little bit about what happened to you so that I can share your burden. And I thought, so here's this woman, when I'm sharing, she starts crying. And it was the first time that that I had seen anyone show any kind of emotion or any kind of just sorrow for what I was going through. And things as simple as sitting there listening to me with a cup of tea or coffee or whatever, you know, it could look like a package of diapers because my daughter was a year and a half old and not body trained. You know, so sometimes it's not the big things that we do. It's just the things that make the other person feel like they matter, like they, they're they heard. Mm. That brings up a lot of emotion for me. <laughs> in a lot of ways that relates to the work that I get to do in the world too as a facilitator, creating those spaces. And I think on a personal level, I can relate in my journey through cancer and that can also be a very alienating experience and that many people don't know what to say or don't know how to help. And so again, there's lots of the loving thoughts coming and it was those moments where I live in a condo and I'd, I'd get a text from a friend and they said, go downstairs and there'd be like, muffins and some flowers (laughs) or yeah just things like that that oh really touched me so deeply but the that profound and simple act of listening and allowing yourself to be empathetic and I love how she said I want to share this burden with you like oh my gosh what a what a gift that is so that's a beautiful lesson for so many people because I don't think I understood what care or help or support looked like either before I went through that and experienced it from the other end. Yeah, and I found out in that tough time who the people were that were willing to do more than, you know, thoughts and prayers. These are the people that I could call to talk. The first time that I heard my daughter squeal with delight was just amazing. I had always kept her quiet because I didn't want her to disturb my ex-husband. And we were staying with a different friend who had four little girls. And so the five little girls were playing in high heels and, and playing dress up with purses and hats. 
I heard her grab one of those purses and just run down the hallway and just squeal with delight when the other girls ran after her. My first instinct was to shush her. And my friend went, you don't have to shush her. Nobody's going to say anything to you or her. She's just having fun. You know, it was just that she was a year and a half old and I'd never heard her like just laugh loudly with complete abandon. And it, it was a blessing to me to be able to hear that. But then to have my friend go, look, you're safe. She's safe. And look, she's having a good time. So let it go. Oh, I love that. I would love to hear your reflections on how that relates or that experience interconnects with the work that you get to do with, I don't know if it's refugee family, but new immigrant families that you work with. Like when you explained your work with your students, I was so deeply touched. So I would love if you would share a bit about what that looks like for you. And if you see some parallels between what you've gone through and what these folks show up with. I do, because I think that my experience has made me more empathetic for them. Some of the students that I teach came with, you know, virtually nothing to the U.S. And they're so happy to be here. And they're so happy to eat the cafeteria food. And they're just, for the most part, they're really grateful. You know, miss, thank you so much. And there are times that I, in fact, today, someone came, one of the girls came to my desk and said, Miss, I didn't bring my water bottle. Do you have a bottle of water? You know, so sometimes kindness looks like handing a child a bottle of water because they didn't bring their water bottle and the drinking fountains are still sealed because of COVID. And they don't want to get a drink with a cup under the faucet in the bathroom sink. You know, sometimes it looks like bottles of water. Other times it looks like, miss, my tummy hurts. And so I sent a different girl to the nurse and the nurse called me and said, she's hungry. She hasn't eaten since lunch yesterday. And so, so there are granola bars or protein bars and those squeezy yogurt tubes in my fridge for the kids who, who need to do that. But, you know, I was so impressed because back in thanks at Thanksgiving, I had them do a word cloud. I asked them what they're thankful for. And with a word cloud, the words they use the most become the largest words. The largest words were family. And then my life was pretty big. My house, you know, my mom, my siblings, and then school and food. And I was thinking, you know, those are things that we take for granted for the most part here in the United States. I just wake up and do my thing. I don't think about my life being something to be grateful for. So the kids challenge me to be grateful for these things. But it's great because we're right now we're making mazes out of cardboard boxes and popsicle sticks. And the kids are so excited about decorating it. And two of the boys made a joint flag between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico because they're one is from their partners, one is from each country. They didn't want to have to decide. So they made a joint flag. And I just think that's, you know, what a great way for them to problem solve this and and to learn to get along and like I said the things that they teach me about being grateful and using what they have and learning to get along and I'm thrilled to to get to work with them how beautiful yeah you're a gift for each other I can see that Donna you've been on quite a journey I am grateful that you are out here sharing your story and your message. And I'm curious, what is the message that has become really clear for you through this process that you feel called to share? You know, I can't change the world as one person. It's really difficult to change the world. But, you know, I can change the world around me. I don't know if you've heard the the story of the starfish. So the story goes, 
there's a little boy on the beach and he's the beach is covered with starfish and the starfish if they don't get back in the water are going to die and so this little boy is throwing one by one he's throwing starfish back into the ocean and there's an old man who comes by and he said you know why are you doing that you can't possibly get them all and the boy says but i made a difference to that one and so that really touches me right um i can't make a difference and save the whole world but I can make a difference to the people around me. I can be kind. I can make sure that they know that they matter for the few minutes that they're in my class or for the minutes that they are assigned to me or whatever. There are kindnesses that I can do for other people that, you know, it's not going to change the world if I make muffins for the next door neighbor or get their mail or, or whatever it is. But it makes a difference to them, that, that genuine kindness to, like you were saying, just to show people that there still is hope and that kindness in the world. So that's my message is, you know, you may not be able to change the world, but being kind to those people right around you will change your area, will change you. That's beautiful, because as we are recording this, there is a war that has broken out, of course, between Ukraine and Russia, and there's so much hurt, and people are feeling hopeless and a lot of despair right now. And just so your message, it's hitting home for me. I know it's going to hit home for whoever is listening, and I'm I'm so grateful. It, we generally end this podcast with what does being the change mean to you? I think you've already answered it. And is there anything else you want to share in that regard? Like the starfish, we're not going to save all of the starfish on the beach. But, you know, we can make a difference in the lives of one person or two people. And, and so that's, that's what that means to me. What can I do to be kind to this person today? That's beautiful. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your story with us. I feel as though when we first chatted, you were doing the work of of bridging worlds together and helping people feel seen and feel heard. I felt that today in in what you shared. I am, again, deeply grateful for, for you and your courage. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I'm now passing the talking piece to you. If you feel called to put your voice in the circle, please head to humconsulting.ca forward slash podcast and share your story there. I cannot wait to hear what has come up for you as you have listened to what has been shared here today. I wish you love and joy beyond your wildest imagination. Thank you so much for being here in the circle of change. I also want to express my gratitude to the following peeps. Circle of Change is recorded on Lekwungen territories, and I am so grateful to live on this land. Our opening and closing music was created by the talented E. Roll Beats. You can find his creations at erollbeats.com. And special thanks to my coach, Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions for bringing this podcast to life. Until next time, ciao.